Hey, welcome to Church Experience Online. We're so happy you joined us today. As you watch this teaching video, if you have any questions or need help getting connected, please don't hesitate to reach out by phone or email. Also, our website is the best place to go if you would like to access helpful growth steps, resources, join a servant team, connect in a life group, get your questions answered, or support this moment financially by giving online. At the end of this teaching video, you'll hear one of our Church Experience Worship original songs, and we hope that gives you an opportunity to worship and reflect on what you learned. Thanks again for joining us at Church Experience Online. I, I almost didn't make it here today. Uh, May 4 uh, was yesterday, and I almost didn't make it today to May 5, because when I went to tuck my kids in at night, I went into their room to say goodnight to them, and they ambushed me. They came out with their lightsabers, and they said, May the 4th be with you. It's Star Wars Day. I'm like, all right, I get it, May 4, and I grabbed a lightsaber, and I battled them a little bit, but I survived, and I made it. I'm here, and, and you know, I, I'm having fun, but I know that you probably had to fight some things to get here today. Anytime you're in worship, you, you, you've had to say no to some other things that were less important. You've had to rearrange schedules. You've had to delay the to-do list. But, but by being here, whatever it was you had to fight through, getting through to get here, it's worth it. It's worth it. You know, because you're making a statement to the world about what's important. You're making a statement to God and worship about what's important to you. And fighting through things to get in the room, to, to worship collectively as God's church, it, it matters. And it, and it impacts our lives. It, it draws us closer to Jesus. And I know it's like getting the kids ready and getting them out the door or trying to think through what you got to get to or saying no to an invitation so you can be here. Thank you for being here. It's a huge statement of worship to God. You know, in, in Hebrews 11, it says, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. And, and it, it's a fact that believers have always been in the habit of getting out of the habit of doing the things that we're supposed to do. Not just believers, but humanity. We've, all, we've always been in that pattern of getting out of the habit of good habits. And so you have to fight to, to make things happen sometimes that are the right thing. So thank you for being here. Come on, give it up for yourselves for being here today. I think that's awesome. We made it. We made it. We're here. And I'm so glad that you did because today we're going to talk about three characters in the Bible. And, and, and the character lessons that we're going to learn from them is going to help us stand strong in the fire that we face in life. It's going to help us uh, have courage to face fears that we come up against in life. It, it's an attribute that I see, this, this courageous attribute that I see in, in these characters. It, it's an attribute that I see in characters and men and women who did great things for God all throughout Scripture and, and you see it in life. You see people who have this. You see something different in them. And so that's what I want for us today. Daniel chapter 3 is where we find the story of these three courageous guys. And maybe the story is familiar to you. Daniel chapter 3 verse 1. It's an incredible story. It says, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of, of gold, 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the advisors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the advisors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, Nations and people of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. King Nebuchadnezzar builds an image and he demands worship. He demands worship, and that, that's, that's facing a fire. In fact, he literally says, if you don't worship, you'll be thrown into the fire. 
And, and, and that, that fire that we're going to talk about today, that fire pressure, we're going to call that pressure that we face in life the fire that we stand up against. You know, I think we, we learned about it first in, in the playground growing up. Right? You remember people with that playground mantra, if you can't stand the heat, get out the kitchen? Remember that? You know, we, we, we know what it's like to face the fire. We know what it's like to come up against the heat in our lives. And there's all kinds of pressure for us, especially as believers in Jesus. There's all kinds of pressure to bow, not to probably a, a large uh, image of gold, a statue, but the idols that are all around us in our culture were we're pressured to bow to them. We're, we're pressured to bow to other things instead of the Lord. And, and there's all kinds of pressure for us to live a sinful lifestyle, to dismiss the ways of God, to affirm unbiblical lifestyles and unbiblical ways of living, to, to be pressured to compromise when it really counts, when it's, when it's not easy, to do the thing that feels good or sounds good in the moment instead of what we know God wants us to do. You probably feel the, the pressure to neglect worship of God or to neglect daily time alone with him. We, we feel the pressure to achieve and to attain more. That, that pressure of greed is there and, and to neglect character. See, see all we can list a lot of different kinds of pressure, but it's there. That fire is real. And I want you to imagine that pressure you face like a continual fire that's, that's always trying to pull you away from Jesus to, to, to pull you more towards the ways of the world, to tempt you, to lure you away from your first love, which should be, should be Christ. And, and, and that fire, we need to be aware of it because the fire of pressure burns hot. Maybe you want to write that down. The fire of pressure, it burns hot. It, it, it's, it's an intense pressure that we face, and the temptation is to bow to cave under that pressure and to, instead of living for God's ways in the world, to live in the world's ways. And as a believer, if I don't have the strength of character to stand in the fire, then I'll get consumed and I'll make compromises that I, have, that I forever regret. If you're kind of newer in your faith, it's more of a recent thing, then the pressure for you is the devil's going to try to put pressure on you to uproot the roots that you're putting down to get you to go back to the old ways you used to live in and to neglect the growth that you've made. If you've been following Jesus for some time, and a lot of you have been living for God, and you try, the, the pressure in your life is going to be a, pr a pressure to let your faith grow cold, to let it be stale, to uh, neglect what is the most important priority in your life, which is Jesus. But that temptation we feel to bow to the things of the world, to compromise in our faith. Imagine if we could develop our character to have the strength to stand in the fire. And I titled today's message, Standing in the Fire. Because I wonder if we could come to a place where we could have this courage. I wonder what it would do in our families. I wonder what it would do in our church, in our, in our community, if we could have the kind of courage that we're going to see these three characters we're going to study today had, the courage to stand up against that pressure to compromise, the courage to stand up and not bow when temptation is there, but to really be strong in our faith and to stand in the fire. I think it would change your life. I think it would change our lives. Well, Daniel chapter 3, the story goes on, and as we go through the story, it really heats up literally. In, in Daniel chapter 3, verse 7, it says, therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshiped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Everybody's doing it. <laughs> you remember that from, you first heard that probably in high school. Everybody, well, everybody's doing it. Like that, that, that was real. I mean, everybody was doing it. Everybody was bowing down and, and worshiping this, this gold image. Verse 8, though, it says, At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. And that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have sent over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold that you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. So these three guys say, we're not going to bow. Even though everybody else is doing it, 
even though there's tremendous consequence if, if we don't bow, there's literally a fire that we'll be thrown into, we're not going to bow to anything other than our God. That, that inspires me. That kind of courage inspires me. See, Nebuchadnezzar, he was furious. The, he, had a, he had a literal fire, but he also had fire in his eyes. He said, if you don't bow, and these three characters said, we refuse to bow to sin. We're not going to bow. We're only going to bow to God. The fire pressure was real. Maybe you feel it in your life. In fact, maybe it'd be helpful to identify it. Where do you feel the most pressure right now in your life? The pressure to compromise what you believe? Where do you feel the pressure to pull back and settle in and chase comfort and success to attain instead of honor? Where do you feel the pressure right now? You know, you know our struggle is really a struggle of worship. It's a pressure of, uh, of who will we worship? Will we, will we worship God or will we worship self? Will we bow to the Lord or will we bow to ourselves? What, what, what is it that you're feeling the pressure to compromise in, in your character and in your faith? You, know, you, you might not ever stand before an idol and be tempted to bow to it, but you'll be tempted to worship other things all the time. And these three guys, they, they were probably facing tremendous temptation to bow. Think about it. All three of them had been promoted. So all three of them had a reputation. They had success. They probably had affluence. They had wealth. Why? Because they, they were leaders in the land. And so, so everybody knew who they were. They had a great position. Man, when you get influence, when you get affluence, when you get success, when, when things start going your way, when it's good, be careful. When, when, when you make progress, when some of your prayers are answered, when you start, you start experiencing good in your life, be careful because that's when you may be most tempted to compromise. It, it's not usually when we're struggling that the biggest test of our character comes. The biggest test in our character is in success. See, these guys had success. They have something to lose. And when you have something to lose, that's when the devil can come to you and, and, and get leverage on you. See, if you don't compromise here, then you can lose this. If you don't cheat here, take a shortcut here, you might not get there. Listen, listen be careful, be careful. When, when we studied church history going through school and they, they showed us the, the map of the nations and where the gospel, where the, the message of Christ has grown and expanded throughout history, it always invaded areas of poverty and, and struggle where people had no hope and, and, and the gospel came and the light of Christ came into the darkness and, and lives were transformed and there was revival and, and lives were transformed and changed because they didn't have much to hold on to and they needed hope. And so they reached out to God and they realized when they had nothing that they really did have something great. And they had true riches and treasures in God. And that was really the most important thing in life. But, but what happens, you can see it even in our own country. You can see it in the, the history of civilizations around the world. Wherever faith came, then prosperity eventually came as well. As, as a direct and indirect result, because when people started abandoning self-destructive, sinful behavior, their lives got better. When they, when, they, when they got out of addictions, when they stopped living in sin, they, started, they stopped living in darkness, and they, they got God's wisdom in life, the one who created life, they started following him. He blessed them, and they, and, and they became wise and prosperous, and, and, and the nations would, would start seeking God, and his blessing would be on them. But then inevitably what would happen, and you can see it, is that because of that prosperity and that advancement and that progress, they got their eyes off of their only hope and they started to hope in things of the world. They started to hope in their, their earthly riches instead of realizing that their real riches are in, in Christ, they're in Jesus and they're in heaven. And they started worshiping and making idols of the blessings instead of worshiping the blesser. And that's when things started to deteriorate and immorality would creep in and eventually it would destroy and undermine nations. And you can see, and then, and then the nations would grow cold and we saw it in Europe and what happened in the church and it was so strong and then it just faded. And, and you, can, you can just literally watch that, not only in human history, but you can watch it in your own life if you're not careful. That, that you can come to Jesus in a moment of desperation and God, I need you. But then when, when he comes and he answers your prayer and, and, and things go well for you, it's in those moments that you're tempted to get your eyes off of him and onto the world. And these three guys, there must have been immense temptation to bow. Because if they would bow, they could keep their jobs. Do you ever have a boss put pressure on you to take a shortcut at work, do something against your character, and you know that if you don't, that promotion you've been hoping for, then increased income is probably not going to come? There's pressure in that. You're facing the fire. They can lose their job. They can lose their wealth. 
They could lose their very lives, but they said, we will not bow. I want that kind of character. I, I want that kind of fire in me so that when I go up against the fire, I can stand. I want that in you. And, and, and we, can, we can have that with the strength of God. He can give that to us. But beware of the pressure. Beware of the pressure when everyone else around you is bowing. See, one of the most difficult times to stand in the fire is when everybody else is bowing. When, when you look around and you're like, I'm the only one. Everybody else is doing this. Everyone else thinks this way. Maybe, maybe I got it wrong. And we start to look around and we start to question and self-doubt and get insecure. But these guys, even though every person, I mean, imagine this. They're looking out. There's this, there's this image, right? And the, the king is on his throne and he's watching and, and everyone is bowing down in the front of them, behind them to their left and to their right, everybody's bowing down. Imagine how awkward you feel standing when everybody else is bowing. But they stood. And they stood for what their convictions were, their character was. Do you have the kind of conviction to stand when everyone else is bowing? Now, make no mistake about it, even when others are bowing, they're watching you. They're watching to see if you'll really stand. See, you invited your coworkers to Easter. You say, come on, I'm a believer. You should come with me to church. But they're watching you when that pressure's on at work. Will you, will you take the shortcut? Will you compromise your character? Because that's where your real invitation is. That's where your real witness is. That's what they're watching. It's not the words. It's, it's your lifestyle. And they're watching to see if you'll back that up. If you'll stand when others are bowing, will, that, will you really stand for your faith? Will you really live that out? And, and so you have eyes on you. You, you have young children, their eyes are on you to see, will, will you really stand when the, when the fire's on? You have neighbors and coworkers that are watching. You know, I, I know they claim to believe, I know they attend church, but do they really, will they stand when the fire is on, when there's pressure? What it, ultimately, here's what I'm asking. What does it take to get you to compromise? What does it take to get us to compromise? There, there's the threshold of our character. I, I, where is your character? What does it take to get you to compromise and bow? See, my daily choice is character or compromise. Maybe that'd be a question you'd want to write down and take with you during the week is, you know, am I, am I choosing character or am I compromising? And, and where am I tempted to compromise? Maybe that'd just be a question you could bring into your time alone with God this week and spend some time praying about that. God, where am I tempted to compromise? Where do I need more courage? Where have I been bowing under pressure? Where is the current of temptation strong to get me to compromise? Once you identify it and you can figure out where that is, then you have a better chance of standing in the fire. Well, there's more to this story, Daniel chapter 3, down in verse, verse 13. It gets real interesting. And furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold that I have set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, and all kinds of music, if... You are ready to fall down and worship the image I have made. Very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? That's fire. <laughs> that's, that's pressure. Verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If, if we are thrown into the fire, the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. They still honor him. Even though they disagree, they honor him. Your majesty, they, they're respectful to him. But verse 18, but even if he does not, even if, would you just say even if? That's a, that's a, that's a great and powerful two words. Even if he does not. We want you to know, your majesty, that we will not. Say, we will not. we will not. We will not. We will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. So the, the pressure is on. <laughs> and wow, these, these guys are literally facing the fire. And there's fear in that moment, right? There's fear of what if this happens? What if that happens? What will they say? What if they're not happy? What if they don't follow? Like we have all these questions when, when we need to stand that come to our mind. The devil uses them to put doubts in our mind, insecurity. And what if? What if? But they said, even if. <laughs> I like that. They, they took it and they turned it from a what if to an even if. Even if it doesn't go how we want it to, we want to be saved from the flames, but even if, we're still going to stand. See, they faced their fear. What, what causes fear in your life? 
What causes you to, your faith to get a little shaky? It might be fear of failure, fear of losses. Some people fear finality or death. They, they fear people. Uh, they fear losing something or losing a reputation. There's a lot of fears that, that people have, but when you stand against a fear and you stand in the fire, you remember that. It grows courage in you. Do you remember a time when you faced fear and you overcame it? I was thinking back to a childhood memory when uh, my, my brothers and I were home. My dad was away at work, and it was an evening, and, the, and my mom was there with us, but this bat got into our living room. And my mom was, was freaking out. Like, she was like, oh, no. And she was so scared. And, and, and me and my brothers were young. Me and my two bros, like, were elementary to, like, lower high school range in that age range. And, and we're, we're there, and, and dad's not there to, you know, save the day. And so mom's panicked. So we're like, well, we got, we got to save mom. We got to defend the house. And, and so we go in the living room where this bat was, and we tip the furniture over. And we're, like, hovered here, and this bat's like, Phew swooping down like like right back and forth and and we're hiding under the furniture and we go like let's go get the bb guns <laughs> so so we went and we got our bb guns and me and my two brothers were hiding behind the furniture and every time that bat would swoop down we'd duck and then he'd go back up on the wall and we're, poof, 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 we're like shooting at him you know and it's like oh no mom, oh, what's gonna happen and we're, we're trying to save the day well we would we'd hit it every once in a while we'd leave little marks up on the wall and, and we, we, this it was, it was crazy i'm telling you we're, we're, we're hiding the bat swooping it was just this epic scene you know, for young boys, right? It, it, we couldn't get him with the BB guns. I think it was the tennis racket that finally took care of it, got him out of the house. We, we were young. Everybody we were just, it was happening, you know? And, and, but my mom, she was, she, was, she was so grateful that the problem was solved. My dad was not so grateful of all the holes that needed to be repaired. The, the house was torn up when he got home. But we felt like heroes. You know, we saved mom. We, we, we saved the day. We, we felt good. We faced our fear, and we overcame. You might remember, I'm having fun, but you might remember a real fear you had to face. You remember how it made your, your chest beat and your, your palms get sweaty and you just felt what it was like to stand in that moment. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're, they're facing their fear. I mean, they're, 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 everything is on the line. Their lives, their reputation, everything is on the line. But they say, you know what? We're not going to bow to fear. What if you could have the kind of character that when you face fear the next time, instead of having the regret that you might have as you look back on the past, the times you may have compromised, what if you said, you know what, I'm standing for the Lord, I'm standing for what I know is right, I'm, I'm, my word means something, my character means something, my integrity means something, I'm not going to compromise, I feel like doing this, this seems like something everybody else would approve of, I want to do this in my flesh, but no, I'm, I'm refusing to compromise, I'm going to stand strong in my faith. What if we could have that kind of courage? It was Billy Graham who said that when, when, when the courageous take a stand, the spines of others are stiffened. What if your courage and your courageous act, like their act, is inspiring us? What if your courage to stand wasn't even really about you? What if it was about the eyes who are watching you and, and how you stood in the fire inspired them to stand in, the, in their own fire that they're going to have to face? You know, we, we need to have that, that kind of courage that, that, that inspires, that, that brings hope to others. You know, kind of like that Steve Rogers said to the Avengers in, in Endgame. He said, this is the fight of our lives. We're going to win whatever it takes. I, I love the audacity of that. Like, th this is it. This is all on the line, all or nothing. Let's go. I think that's what God's looking for, people who have that kind of courage, that even if, Christians, even if it doesn't go well, I'm all in. We need more believers like that. You know, I talked to my brother-in-law, Brent, and Jennifer's younger bro, and I, I said, hey, man, tell me about ping pong. Because you're, you're a big ping pong player. I'm like, like what, tell me some stories. He's like, well, in college, one time we were playing ping pong, and we, we, we got into this game called sting pong. And sting pong is when you score on somebody, and if you get the point, then they have to turn around and take their shirt off, and you get to smack the ball as hard as you can at their back, and it leaves welts. And so this is like their college game. He would tell me that they would play. I'm like, man, that doesn't sound, sting pong doesn't sound like my game. You know, this is pretty intense. But I like to play ping pong. I'm not, like, great at it, but I, I like to play. It's fun. I'll play it with my kids. Put my friend Steven here, and you know we'll play ping pong. I, I think it's a fascinating game uh, that someone came up with. A great idea because it, you can play it casually or you can get intense. You know, casual game might last five minutes, but the pros, when they play, a game can last 30 minutes, and they can hit a ping pong ball 100 miles an hour. Literally, like they'll hit it 100 miles an hour. Now, you and I, we might burn 200 calories, they say, playing a casual game of ping pong. You can burn, if you're intense, you can, you can burn up to 500 calories an hour playing ping pong. So there you go. Somebody's looking for a fitness plan, get a ping pong table. There you go. But, you know, ping pong is, is interesting, you know, because there's, it's a very simple game, but it, it's difficult to do it for a long period of time. Um, but the Guinness Book of World Records, there was a father and son duo, uh, Daniel and Peter Ives. 
And they played ping pong. They volleyed back and forth. Check this out. For eight hours and 40 minutes. That's 32,000 consecutive hits without missing it one time. The Guinness Book of World Records. You think we could do that, Stephen? I, I, I don't think so. <laughs> it's, it's just an admirable goal. But, you know, when you're playing ping pong, it's all about you hit the ball, then they hit it. You hit it, then they hit it. And it's, it's back and forth. It takes two to play. It, it takes two to go back and forth. Unfortunately, some of us are trying to, in our character and, and how we make decisions, we're trying to play both sides of the table. What we're doing is we're saying, well, I, I think this is the right thing to do. And so we make our move or we go to make our move. But then we run over to the other side of the table and we say, well, what if they do this? Well, maybe because they might react poorly to that, maybe I should change my move and do this. But then we run back over to the table again and we say, well, I think I should go right, but what if they all go left? And so we run back over here to the table and we say, well, I think this is what God would want me to do, but what if it doesn't make everybody happy? Or I think this is how I should parent my kids, but what if they don't like it? Or, you know, this is what I think I should do in my career, but what if it doesn't make me enough money? And so we're running back and forth. We're changing our convictions based on what we think other people will do. And we're saying, I think I should do this, but what if they do that? And, and you live right there in, in the world of insecurity. And that's where a lot of people live. In fact, this can be a very controlling place to be. Some people live very control, controlling lives because they're always trying to manipulate and control other people's moves. And, and, and then they're not strong in conviction. They're not very solid because they're trying to figure out what everyone else does before they do it. And, and they want to stand for things, but then it's not popular. So then they adjust. You can see what I'm saying when you're trying to play both sides of the table. It, it, it doesn't work well. You don't have that strength of character. And, and what we see here in, in, in Scripture is that we're not called to control anyone else's moves. These three guys says, even if they do that, we're, we're going to do this. We're going to please God. We're not living for the approval of man. We're living for the approval of the Lord. Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. It says, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? And then would you just read this question with me here on the screen? Or am I trying to please people? Would you read that with me? Or am I trying to please people? And read this last part real loud with me. If I were still trying to please people, I would not. Say, I would not. I would not be a servant of Christ. So here it tells us, if I'm trying to please people, then, then I'm not pleasing God. Because those two, they, they contradict each other. I, I can't say, God, I'll only bow to you and then also come over here and bow to an idol. I had to pick one or the other. And, and so are you, are, are you getting caught in the way of the world trying to please people? What will they think? What will they do? Are you making your moves to please God or to please others? That's what I'm trying to get at. And, and, and you will never stand in the fire if you're making your moves trying to please people, trying to please others. You will only have the courage and the strength to stand in the fire if you're making your moves to please God. And you say, God, even if... Even if they do this, I will not. I will not compromise. I will only bow to you. We, we desperately need more even if Christians. Even if it doesn't go well with me, I will not. We need some will not believers. I will not compromise my integrity. I will not lie and cheat and steal. That's my integrity. I will not do that. I will not get caught in this selfish, greedy culture. More, 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 more. That, I, I will not. We need some believers to say, I will not tolerate sexual immorality in my life. The Bible is real clear that, that our sexuality is to be within a marriage, between a man and a woman, as companions for life. That's the only place that he blesses that. And, and, and that's not popular, but, but man, I will not compromise that in my life. We need more believers to say, I will not miss, I, I will not miss time with God every day. That's so important. I will not miss worship. I will not let the devil win in my life, my family, my church, my city. I will not. See, we need, we need stronger convictions. I was talking to a, a good friend the other day, and we were talking about something, and I, I was bringing up something that I, I believe, I think, but I, I just said it casually. I wasn't paying attention to my words, and I said, I feel like, and, and I said, I feel like, and he, he stopped me, as a good friend can do, and he said, hey, what you mean is I think. That's the world's way is I feel. And I was like, I, I received that rebuke. I, I'm with you, and, and, I, and I adjusted what I was saying. And what I've noticed is that, that, that even though that was just a, a turn of a phrase, that, that's slipped into our culture, hasn't it? 
Like people make decisions based on how I feel. God gave us feelings. They're, the feelings are from him. But when you make your convictions based on what you feel, like you'll never have the strength of character to stand in the fire. Because there's times where you don't feel like standing. I don't think Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego felt like being the only ones. I don't think they felt like going through the fire and being thrown in the fire, but they knew what was right. Their convictions were not based on a feeling. When, when we base our decisions based on how I feel about it, how, I just kind of feel that this is the right thing. Based on my history, based on other people's opinions, based on what I think and see in the world, this is what I feel. We're elevating our opinion above God's word. And we're saying, well, I know God says this, but I feel this way. And that's a dangerous, very dangerous place to be. I still feel things. You're still going to feel things. God gave you emotions. It's very purposeful and feelings are a very important part of our lives. But that's not primarily how we make our decisions that's not where we base our convictions. Our convictions are based in truth, not in a feeling. And if it's based in a feeling, it's going to be wherever the wind leads me today and wherever it leads me tomorrow is where I'm going to fall. And a lot of people live that way. Even believers live that way. And you want to have the strength of character. You want to have the, the character say, I'm standing on what's right. And the only authority that's strong enough to stand on is God's word. So here's my question for you. What, what, if, what is my God pleasing even if that I will not be moved from? What is that for you? What, what, is my, what is my even if that I will not be moved from? Do you have that? Do you have conviction? Now, <laughs> some of us are like nudging the person next to us and we're saying, I'm glad I came today. This is an easy day. I, I got this one. I, I'm the kind of person I'm not going to, I'm not bowing to culture. I'm not, I'm not flexible. I'm, I'm firm in my, my beliefs. And if that's you, I would just, just take a, just a quick little detour and just say to you, be careful if you're the kind of person who this message, you're like, oh, I got this. Because if you heard the phrase, don't die on every hill, <laughs> have you heard that one, don't die on every hill? See, uh, where that comes from is that there's some people who have really strong feelings who say, well, I, 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 I believe this. And it's like an opinion. It's not, it's not, it's not a, a, a absolute truth. It's like their opinion that they've added on. And, and they won't budge from that opinion, that preference. Like they're, they're inflexible. And what happens if you become, and, and listen, a lot of leaders are this way. I've sat with a lot of them, learned from a lot of great leaders where they have strong uh, opinions. And if you're someone who has strong opinions, that's a good thing overall because that means you'll have a strength of character to stand when others won't. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego probably had that in them. Like, I, I'm not going to compromise. But for you, what you need to keep in mind is that if, if, you, if you stop listening to others, if you stop respecting others and honoring others, even those who disagree with you, then you'll come across as very judgmental and prideful and legalistic over every little detail. It's just very dangerous. And churches can slip into this. For example, we have strong convictions on what we believe the Bible teaches, but the mat at our door will always be a welcome mat. And so you can come in and belong before you believe. We're going to love on you, and we're not going to treat you differently if you're living a certain lifestyle or you don't believe in God or you worship some other God that we would say is not a real God. We're just going to love on you when you come through these doors no matter what. When we started the church, we said, guys, don't try to sell anybody at this first barbecue in a little living room full of people. Don't try to sell anybody on our church at this barbecue. Let's just love people to Jesus. Let's just do that. Let's not try to convince them to be a part of what we're doing. Let's share a story of what God has done in our life and just love people to Jesus. We found that to be an effective thing because, listen, if, if you get so opinionated on how everybody else started to control everybody else and, and what you think they should do and live, then what happens is that, come, that turns people away. Now, you stand strong on what you believe, but, but if, if you have a strong opinion on everything and you're not willing to listen to others, then just, just be careful. Be careful. You see, even these three, they honored the king. They didn't agree with everything he did, but they called it your majesty. And, and they would not have been in positions of leadership in his kingdom had they disrespected him. They didn't agree. Certainly, he was an evil king, but they did not agree with everything that he did. But they did not dishonor him. See, you can still, God still expects us to honor people that we disagree with. We still love them. Even loving your enemies, Jesus talks about. We love others, but we don't compromise our, our beliefs. It's just important to know if you have strong opinions. Make your convictions that you'll die for God's absolutes, not your opinions. Okay, just be, just be weary of that. In fact, even in our beliefs, there's layers of belief. We, we put our, our core 15 or so beliefs, 20 beliefs, whatever they are, on, online to say, and we teach them in our first class. These are, these are the things that are you know, written in blood. Like, these are the things we die for. You know, Jesus, you know, life and death and resurrection and salvation is through, through God's grace, through faith alone in him. And we believe there's an eternal heaven and eternal hell. And, you know, the only way for forgiveness is through Christ alone. I mean, all the core convictions that 90% of churches hold on to and say, yeah, this is, this is the core of what the God, God's word says. Those things are written in blood. And then there's a lot of things that are written in pen. 
that's like, we really believe this and we understand this, but, but we can still worship together. You're from a Baptist background. You're from a Lutheran background. You're from a Catholic background. We can kind of still come together and worship, and, and there might be some differences in, you know, how does this work out theologically, and we can still have unity even though there's some strongly held opinions. And then there's things in pencil that, you know, like, we, we think this is, right, but, I mean, this is man's best understanding of what this means. We know Jesus is coming back, but how is he going to come back? Like, which way is he going to come back and when? Like, we don't know all those things, and so people get their opinions on that, and that's written in pencil. So you have layers of what you're willing to hold on to to die for, but, but you need to know what those are. Do you know? Do you know what your will nots are? What I will not be moved from? I'll give my life for that. These guys knew that, and so they wouldn't bow to culture. Well, this story takes a crazy turn in verse 19, and Daniel chapter 3 says, then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual, and he commanded the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men wearing their their robes, their trousers, their turbans, their other clothes, they were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. You know, this is not how we expect the story to go. On first read, we're thinking, well, these guys are standing up for God. God's going to stand up for them. They got this. No worries. They even said, well, God can, God can deliver us from you if, if he wants to do that. So we kind of expect that God will bless us. We start following Jesus. We start worshiping him. We make some hard decisions. We stand courageously at our work, and we get fired. We lose our job. Things fall apart on the home front. Our finances struggle. We say, well, God, what's up? I'm living for you. I'm honoring you. Why is it difficult? See, you, you, would, you would set yourself back significantly and do yourself a disservice if you thought that following Jesus would exempt you from trials. In fact, we're told to even count it joy when we go through trials because God is refining us. He's strengthening us. And, and when you go through trials, your convictions are not only displayed, but they're also strengthened. And sometimes God allows us, he doesn't create all the trials in our life, but he allows us to experience them so that we will stay close to him and grow closer to him. He he refines us. And there's even been believers throughout church history who have been burned in the fire, literally burned at the stake. There's been believers, think about this, who've been sawed in two, who've been tortured, who've lost everything, home and family, all for the sake that they would not compromise. They would not recant their beliefs. So you say, you, you, you can live, you can keep everything if you just say, we disown Jesus. And they said, we will not. We will stand. We will die for what we believe in. And, and God forbid you ever have to go through something like that, but do you have the courage to stand in the fire? These guys had the courage to stand, and they suffered loss even though they stood. They were thrown into the fire. See, fear holds many believers back. Because they say, what if? What if this happened? And, and, and they don't want to let go. I don't want to lose, I don't want to lose all that I've attained in this world. So, so what if I, I stand for Jesus and he asks me to surrender more to him? Or, or what if I step up for Christ and I give more to him and then I, I experience loss? So that holds us back. But here's where the real wins happen. Here's where miracles can happen. When you stand courageously, you face the fire and, and you walk through the fire. For him. They were literally thrown into the fire. And, and where do you find courage like that? It's in God's presence. That's probably one of the most important things I'm going to be able to say to you today is, is if you want more courage, if you want this character in you, where do you find it? God's presence. God's presence. Where do you get it? God's presence. In prayer, in his word, in worship. Where can you get that courage to stand? It's in God's presence. In God's presence, I find courage to face my fears. In God's presence, I find courage to overcome what I'm worried about. In God's presence, I find courage to defeat adversity and win my battles. In God's presence, I find courage to seize a big opportunity. My courage flows from God's presence. That's what you need to know. The last part of this story is just unbelievable. God shows up in a supernatural way. It's amazing. Daniel 3, verse 24 then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement, and he asked his advisors, weren't, three, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace, and he shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. 
So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the royal advisors crowded around him. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies. Check this out. Nor was a hair of their head singed. Their robes were not even scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. They said, we will not bow down, and God blessed that. See, you want to really experience the miracles that God wants to do in your life until you stand like that. See, when, when we back down and when we bow down and compromise, we never get to stand in the fire and see God show up. And he did show up. There was a fourth person in the fire, and then there was the three of them, and then there was someone else there. See, God went with them into the fire. They were not alone. And some of you are thinking about stepping up more boldly, really living out your faith, letting go of some sin, holding on to Christ, first love, putting him up higher in my life. But, but you're fearful. You're afraid. Well, what happens? Listen, until you take your stand, until you step out in faith, until you stand up in the fire, you don't get to see the miraculous provision of God. If you always play it safe, you never get to see God come through in a big way. If you live small, you don't get to see God do big things. So they, they stood up. They were willing to risk it all, to risk success, risk their reputation, risk it all to have the courage to stand. See, these three knew that if you're going to step into the fire, you don't step into the fire alone. God will see you through it. All you got to do is hold on to him. I've loved surfing most of my life. I've surfed in like nine different states, and I got the honor of teaching Jennifer's uh, brother, Brent, how to surf when I was 19 and he was 15, 16. I helped get him out on his first surfboard and show him how to get out in the waves. And if I was teaching you to, to surf, uh, there's some things I would teach you. And uh, I, I was able to give Brent some, some initial lessons. And, you know, one of our first times going out, uh, we were 16, I, I was, when he was 16, I was, I was saying, man, here's how you get out in the waves, here's how you surf, and he ended up, like, getting really good at it. In fact, he got even better than me down the road, he, he surfed a lot, and anytime I would come home on a break, he lived in San Diego, we'd, like, go out and hit the waves, just for a quick, you know, two-hour session. We'd go out real quick, and one, one time when he was young, living at home with his parents, I wanted to take him out around Christmas and go surfing, and his mom said, well, Brent, you have to be back for dad's Christmas production at our church. And, and he's like, I won't be late. I won't miss it, Mom. We only had a little window to go surf, and he's like, I'll be there. He's like, all right, you can go, but only if you don't miss. So we knew we could not miss the Christmas production. So we, we drive out to La Jolla Beach, make a little 30-minute drive out there. We unload the boards. We get out in the water. We're surfing, having so much fun. Time's flying by. We get out of the water just in time, just barely gave us ourselves enough time to get back. And we, we pull the key out of the wetsuit from that cold Pacific water. We pull that key out, and it had been really cold from the water. We put it in the, the lock of the, the family minivan, and we turn the lock to unlock the vehicle. And as we turned it, snap, the, the key broke off in the lock. And we're like, oh, no, we're stuck. Because we know this is pre-Uber days. We can't just get an Uber and get there on time. We're, like, they're not coming to pick us up. They're not driving all this way. He's got to preach that night. Their family's not coming. We're stuck. Like, we don't have any other options. Like, we don't know what to do. And, and so we, we finally get this little bit of the end of the key out of the lock. And we're like, well, we got two pieces. What if? We know that it's going to be a problem, like, getting it out of the ignition later. But what if we could get the pieces in the ignition and it would turn on? We're like, oh, that sounds risky, man. What if, what if it ruins the car? What if we can't get out? We cannot miss the Christmas production. We got to get there. So we put that little piece in there, and we shove it in with the, the little handle of the key, and we turn it on, and boom, it fires up. We're like, yes, we're good. Let's go. We made it. We made it to Christmas. It was good. Thank God we were able to get the key out later. But what, what, what a memory. And, and I remember so many times like that, adventures that were made surfing. But you know what? None of them would have happened. None of them would have happened, rewind the tape, if we want to learn one lesson when we were surfing. And that was that when you're going out into the lineup, if you're going to get past the waves that are coming at you, you have to learn to do something called duck diving. Now, duck diving is when you, you see a wave coming at you, and, and you grab the front of the board, and you push it down underneath the wave, and you use your feet and your arms, and you push the board down. This is the, one of the first things I would teach you for us teaching you to surf. You push the board down, and then that wave, when you feel it and you hear it washing over you, you pull up on the front of the board, and you come out the other side. 
a lot of people just on vacations, amateur servers just try to learn. They don't know this. And so what happens is they try to swim out past the wave, and this big five-foot wave comes at them and just washes them right back to the shore. And they can never get out to where the, the best waves are. They're just constantly battling the waves. But if you watch someone who knows what they're doing, what they'll do is they'll duck dive. They'll push the board down. They'll hold on to it. When the wave starts going over their head, they use the momentum of the wave, and they pull it up, and it shoots them out the other end. So instead of getting pulled back, they actually move forward when the wave is coming at them. You want to know how to not to get swept back all the time and, and how to keep making gains in your life, how not to let the world just keep pushing you back and getting you to compromise? I'll tell you how to do it. When, when those waves come, when the fire comes like it came for these guys, you hold on with everything you've got to the Lord. You get closer to him. Don't let, don't let the world pull you away. You, you lean in. You grab hold of him. And then when you feel that wave, you feel the intensity of it washing over you. You hold on to him with all you've got, and you find that what he does is he, he actually can build momentum in your life in the fire. He can build momentum when you go through the trials. He can give you strength you never knew was there. He can show up miraculously if he chooses to, and he can bring you out the other side, in their case, unharmed. Not a hair on their head was singed. See, he went with them in the fire, and you never stand alone in the fire. You need to know that. Maybe you want to write it down. You never stand alone in the fire. You never stand alone. And some of you, as you go into this week, I want you to know as our band comes out and we, we prepare to wrap up this service that as you leave this place and you go back into the fire, you don't go alone. He's with you in the fire. You never stand alone in the fire. He's with you. And you know what? He doesn't want to just give you fire insurance. Some of you think, well, my faith is just fire insurance. If something bad happens, I can kind of reach out to him. He doesn't want to just give you fire insurance. That's not what the gospel is all about. And the message of Christ is not about fire insurance. It's there to make you fireproof. Fireproof, meaning you can go through the fire and you might face setbacks and losses, but you can even get through the fires of life. You can get through the trials of life. When you feel that wave sweeping over, you can hold on to the Lord and he can get you through anything if you'll stand for him and know that you never stand alone. Thanks for joining us at Church Experience Online. Please don't forget to check out the website if you'd like to get more connected, learn more, get your questions answered, or support this movement financially. You're now going to hear a Church Experience Worship Original Song, and we hope this gives you an opportunity to worship and reflect on what you learned today. Let's go.